Hello, everyone. Wow, it's been a while. Sorry for the long break. Had to take some time off for the holidays. Finished Food Lies episode one, which we're now showing privately to production companies, studios, and some other key people. So let me know if you know anyone in the industry. We need to get this on Netflix. We need to get to the big players. DM me on Instagram or email me. That would be really appreciated. We need as much help as we can get. Funding as well, foodlies.org. Thanks for that. And we're back for another season of Peak Human. We're starting off with a bang with Dr. Steven Simpson and Dr. David Robinheimer. These guys came up with a protein leverage hypothesis. They've been doing amazing work for 37 years together. And I really love their book, Eat Like the Animals. And I read it twice. And I just think they are amazing when you zoom out to really understand nutrition, not getting caught up in any diet of the day, but looking at it from an ecological perspective Beyond any dietary camp, this framework rings true. This is everything. And I've been talking about it for years, and I finally got to interview them. Everything makes sense when you think about it, how they do. And they've studied over 40 animal species, and they get the same result. It comes back to protein leverage. It comes back to real foods. It comes back to having the natural environment that the animal evolved in. And simply put, humans have left that natural environment and processed foods have taken over. But this is the why. This is the why behind it. Why do people overeat when no one wants to? You'll get your answers in this episode. Also, check out backtohumanretreats.com. We're doing a retreat in Panama. This thing is going to be amazing. This first retreat we're doing is a five-star experience. This one is all out. Maybe we'll do some other ones that, that aren't so elaborate in the future. Check that out, backtohumanretreats.com. Nose to tail, of course. We still got some of our pasture-raised low poof of pork. All the body care products, man, only stuff that I'd use. Check those out at nosetotail.org. And that's it for now. Please enjoy this episode. All right. Hello. We got Drs. Robinheimer and Simpson, the classic combo on the Eat Like the Animals, uh, Five Appetites book. How are you doing? Good. Thanks, Brian. Good to Very see well, you. Thanks, Brian. Good to see yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. I read your book twice, and we've been probably three, four months in the making for this episode, and we got a chance to talk before the holidays, and uh, David went to China in the meantime. Maybe we can start with a little download from each of you on what you've been up to lately and who, who you are and what you do. Over to you, Dave. You go first. Okay, I'm a David Robin. I'm a professor of nutritional ecology at the Charles Perkins Centre at the University of Sydney. Um, what a nutritional ecologist does is studies nutrition from the perspective of how animal biology interacts with food environments to generate um, uh, outcomes, both for the animal in terms of its health and um, the various other things that nutrition is important for, and also for the environment in terms of sustaining a food environment that enables populations to continue to thrive or otherwise. Um, a lot of my work is on non-human animals, both in the wild and in the lab. And um, what I also do a lot of is looking at um, how the lessons from the natural world apply to nutrition in our own species, in our greatly modified food environments. And um, I'm Steve Simpson, and I'm the academic director of the Charles Perkins Centre here at the University of Sydney. David and I have worked together for 37 years when we first met in a medieval woodland just outside of Oxford in 1987, and we've been on this nutritional science journey ever since. Um, latterly, through the establishment of the Charles Perkins Centre here at the University of Sydney, what we've done is to take our multidisciplinary agenda and to really take it to the next scale in one of the world's great interdisciplinary research institutes. Now, 10 years old, um, and we brought together philosophers, historians, basic biomedical scientists, clinicians, engineers, mathematicians, and many more to address the burden of chronic disease. And we, as we have in our research career together, have taken inspiration from the natural world and turned it to the study of humans and where we've gone wrong 
in our modern environment. That's amazing. That's all I want to figure out. Um, my podcast has been going for six years. It's called Peak Human, but really it's discovering why we are sick and how to reverse that. Like, what is it with our diet and lifestyle that is making humans so obese and sick and what we can do about it? And I'm glad to hear that you have a multidisciplinary approach. What are you uh, get, getting through to people? Are, are people on the same page in this group? Do they? Yeah. Absolutely. So if if you take now the center um, comprises more than a thousand members, um, academics working together, working through policy, through clinical practice, through public outreach, through basic scientific discovery, um, through the creative arts. We have writers and residents. We have poets and playwrights and novelists involved telling the stories of health and our relationship as humans with our world. So yes, it's getting through, it's getting through in many different ways. And indeed the model we've developed here, which itself was inspired by biology, um, is now being emulated internationally at institutions around the world. So yeah, we're getting there. And it, it's not surprising because the problems that we're tackling or tackle problems that don't respect academic disciplinary boundaries, they sit across and between them. And one of the limitations of traditional academia is the um, specialization into silos where you get to know one subject really very, very well, very, very deeply. And that's critically important. But the problem is that the challenges have eluded us because very often the issues lie at the interface between those disciplines. And that's what we were able to do at the Charles Perkins Center, is step back and take an overall perspective as to what's driving these problems, like the obesity epidemic, and what do we need to know in order to properly understand and to manage those. And that, as Steve said, um, really does involve um, interdisciplinary teams working together with a common vision, a common goal. Yeah. and. I'm glad that you're bringing this nutrition ecology approach because my view of things is we've just gone away from our roots as human animals, right? We are human animals and we have a natural environment and you two are, are the forefront of studying this for many years. And I, I don't think that everyone's on the same page. That's why I was asking, I'm hoping people are on the same page because some scientists, they get really myopic into their little mechanisms and they don't take the broader approach of we are human animals and we have needs and we have environments and we have food needs that aren't being met. And so maybe you could start there with just what, what are our food needs that are being met? Well, well firstly, the, firstly yeah. just let me say that um, I absolutely agree with you, Brian. That's a very important point. And it's one of the great values of studying the natural world is that it enables us as scientists to place our own species into context. And we can look at what it is that other species do and um, all of the species that we've studied in undisturbed natural environments thrive. They are healthy. They are able to select diets that are really optimal for what they require. And the question is, well, how do they do that? And how do we differ? So that's a really different starting point to approaching the problems of human and, health. And ex exactly diets. right. Um, no species, as we point out in Eat Like the Animals and the history of life on Earth has ever required uh, an app or a, an implanted glucose monitor or a fad diet to attain a balanced diet. Um, and that's despite the fact that attaining nutritional balance, which requires getting dozens of different macro and micronutrients in the right proportions and the right quantities to suit the needs of the animal at the time is a massively difficult challenge. And those sorts of highly complex challenges have been addressed endlessly throughout evolution by evolution, by natural selection. So asking the question, how do other species attain nutrient balance when they're in their natural environments? How have they done that time and time and time again? And what can we learn that's fundamental, something that, that cuts across all of the species and is applicable to we humans? 
And that's really where our journey began, isn't it, Dave? Yeah. Starting, ironically, with bugs. We wanted to know, well, how do these very simple, biologically simple um, organisms do such a good job of balancing their diet? And um, they're easy to work with in the lab. They enabled us to attain really very tight control over which things were varied and which things remained constant in the experiments and led us to some very clear um, unequivocal answers as to how they they do that and and that's where it began as Steve said we started asking once we had discovered that started asking well, what about other species and ultimately our own yeah and animals don't count calories right they don't have an app this is the biggest problem I have with the modern paradigm of nutrition is they just keep talking about calories hey everyone just jumping in real quick to tell you about nosetail.org this is my company. This is why I don't have other advertisers. I can just talk about the products that I make and I believe in. We have Biltong back. This is the best version of beef jerky. It's no sugar, no curing agents, just real food, just vinegar and seasoning. We got the body care. You don't want to put fake stuff in your skin. Our body care is edible. It's beef tallow. It's all real ingredients. And it's amazing. Best of all, it's so good. So check those out, nosetail.org, get your pork, got a little bit left. Thanks guys. And it's just so stupid to me. It goes way beyond calories. Obviously, if you eat less, you can lose weight, right? No one's debating that, that yes, but that doesn't tell you about your nutritional status. That doesn't tell you if you're hungry or not. If you're you know starving yourself, yes, of course you can lose weight, but it's not going to sustain yourself. Animals don't have to think about it. So you started with locusts, I believe. And what, so tell us, maybe Steve, you can start telling us with the story of, of where you started and where you got to. Yeah, so locusts are um, particularly interesting if you're an entomologist, and um, both David and I were entomologists from our early training in academia as researchers. They're really significant because they're massively important as a, a pest. They're a scourge of large parts of the planet, particularly uh, North Africa, where they produce these massive upsurges and swarms and they can devastate agriculture and cause great harm to um, the well-being of human populations. And th they're considered to be um, voracious and eating everything in their path. And when you've got billions of insects, that's certainly the impact they have. But they were a really good system to ask the question, um, if something as voracious and apparently insatiable as a locust can still balance its diet, how does it do it? And can we learn anything from it? So we started to study whether they counted calories and we quickly found that they didn't. They actually broke the calories down into macronutrients and micronutrients. And we showed early on that they possess specific nutrient appetites for carbohydrate, protein, and salt. They were the three that we discovered rather early on in our research with locusts. But the, the really interesting question was not that they have these specific appetites, that's a crucial part of their biology and it helps them balanced their diet and we showed how they did that and we understood right down to the level of the neural mechanisms how they did that. But the question that arose was what happens if they're in an imbalanced food environment and those appetites, which otherwise work together, are forced to compete with one another? Does one of them win out over the others? And so we set up a whole series of experiments uh, David and I spent many, many hours in hot rooms um, cooking diets for locusts that varied systematically in their protein and carbohydrate and fiber content. Um, and then we confined insects to one of this large array of different diet formulations and showed really clearly that what the locusts cared about was making sure they got the right amount of protein. And that meant that if they're on a lower than optimal protein concentration because they had more carbs in their diet, fat not being a major constituent of the energy intake of foliage feeding locusts, 
then what they did was they ate more food and they got therefore more calories if protein was diluted with carbohydrate or simply ate more food if you diluted with fiber. We had some remarkable results. You could dilute the food of a locust or the protein in the food of a locust by adding five times more cellulose, which is indigestible, and the animals would eat five times more food to get the right amount of protein. We also found that if they were stuck on a diet low in protein, by over-consuming calories to get enough protein, they ended up obese. Um, and it's pretty hard to tell a locust's obese, but um, they were. They were chock full of fat within their exoskeleton and they lived less long and they took longer to develop as a result of that. And likewise, if you put them on a higher than optimal protein concentration, they would eat less food and they would eat less calories and they would become very lean and they would lose weight because their bodies wouldn't let them overconsume protein substantially to get even enough energy to remain an energy balance. And that was the beginning. That was um, an indication that locusts have specific appetites and that protein is the dominant of those. And in an imbalanced food environment can drive the animal to eat either too much or too little by way of total calories. And that really was the the beginning and we headed off from there in the early 1990s, um, mid 1990s with that um, set of observations and insights, we started to pursue a much broader agenda. And David, talk about the protein leverage hypothesis that came from this. Well, the protein leverage hypothesis builds directly on the story that Steve, as you've said, that Steve just described. And um, the first, the hypothesis Firstly, was that we too have um, separate appetites for different nutrients, um, and we tested that, and we do, and there was some research suggesting that prior, um, and that we too have a very strong protein appetite that overrides the appetites for other nutrients, as do the locusts, and we tested that, and overwhelmingly that is the case, and that is known as protein leverage because um, what it proposes is that the strong, what it shows is the strong appetite for protein in humans like other species is what determines the intake of other nutrients like fat and carbohydrate. So now we've shown in several randomized control trials and other groups have too that we do have this protein leverage um, based uh, uh, regulatory biology and the protein leverage hypothesis then proposes that that biology has interacted with our changing food environment to drive energy overconsumption and the obesity epidemic. And the specific component of the food environment that is changing, our studies and others have shown, is this increasing availability of highly processed industrial foods. If you look at the composition of those, which we and many others have, you find that the two key issues that characterize them are low protein content, especially relative to fat and carbohydrate, and also low fiber, fiber being, together with protein, a second important break on the human appetite. So the protein leverage hypothesis um, proposes that this dilution through ultra-processed foods in our food system of protein and fiber with fats and carbohydrates has interacted with a strong protein appetite to drive overconsumption of fat and carbohydrates and dense obesity. Yes, yeah, so this is the most fascinating topic to me and of all the stuff I've done. I've been in this 10 years, uh, not quite as long as you two, but I've just been trying to figure out why do humans overeat? Because everyone out there knows that it has something to do with calories, but why I think the calorie counting is stupid because no one wants to overeat calories, yet people do. So then you have to go a level deeper is why. And that's what you're doing is why do people overeat calories when they don't want to? Protein diluted. So quick little, my, the way I explain it to people is what you've been talking about, but food, you kind of can break it down into protein and energy. And our mutual friend, Dr. Ted Naiman, has really spearheaded this and popularized it on Twitter and wherever and on my podcast that fats and carbs are mostly energy and 
protein and nutrients, you know, are, are the building blocks. And for all of history in our natural environment, we could eat foods around us and get the right amount of protein and nutrients and get the right amount of energy to get us through the day. Now with modern foods, they're diluted in protein and nutrients. So we're not, so most people are undernourished and they're overfed with the calories, right? So they're getting too many fat or carbs, right? We don't even have to differentiate between the two. And I, before, you know, there's a lot of different people in different camps, keto camp, or there's a low fat vegan camp, you know, and they're saying, oh, fat's the problem, carbs are the problem. It's actually both. And it's actually the refined energy. When you refine them, that's where the problems occur. And protein that was, that was, I just want to say, adding to second. that, Brian, protein okay. leverage is a very different framing of the issue because what it does is it says that the reason we overeat fats and carbs is not that we have particularly strong appetites for those nutrients but because we have a stronger appetite for the third nutrient that's seldom considered in relation to the obesity problem so the mechanistic crux the thing that's driving it that's leveraging the overconsumption of those nutrients. Sure, they carry the calories, but we need to sit back and look at the mixture because protein is the key issue. And that was what caused a bit of consternation when we first published the idea because we, we essentially flipped the whole argument on its head and, and people had before that quite rightly said that the excess calories that have accompanied the obesity epidemic have come not from protein, that's remained remarkably stable. The source of protein has changed, but protein total has, has remained incredibly constant, whereas fats and carbs have undoubtedly contributed the excess calories. So therefore, it must be fats and carbs. And we pointed out, actually, no, uh, the regulation of protein to be so constant um, would be, in our view, a, a potential candidate for the underlying driver, and that's essentially protein leverage, um, protein leverage hypothesis. And um, now the evidence, and we synthesized it most recently in a paper uh, in 2023 that arose from a, a conference at the Royal Society in London, um, is really overwhelming. If you look now at the, uh, not only the evidence in support of it, but also everything else that you can integrate under that idea that relates to the food production industries, the cost of protein relative to other macronutrients, socioeconomic disadvantage as a driver of obesity, changes during development such as the menopause transition, requirements for protein changing as you get older, obesity being um, predisposed by too high protein diets during pregnancy. There's a whole set of really important health issues that come into clear um, focus when you see them through the lens of what we call protein leverage theory, which itself is a part of a broader um, framework that we developed um, called nutritional geometry. Um, and the nut nutritional geometry also allows you to start parsing the effects of nutrients once you've eaten them, as well as their impacts on appetite. So that that's a much broader body of work uh, that we've authored over the years. But protein leverage is, is a key idea that came out of that. And ultimately, and we're now showing that it's not just impacts. It doesn't just impact and affect uh, human health. It also impacts the environment. It's a really important link to global sustainability because um, there, if you dilute, um, if you reduce the level of protein, especially animal based protein in the diet, there's very strong evidence that that reduces the particularly the greenhouse gas, but other environmental impacts. But but the, the net effect depends on what you dilute, what you re, what you replace animal based protein in the diet with. If you replace it with with whole food, um, plant-based diets, you do get a reduction in environmental impact. But that's not typically what people do. They replace it with ultra-processed foods and you know, typical Western diet. And the problem with that is that, as we've said, it causes us to overeat energy. And every kilojoule of energy that we overeat 
exerts an impact and cost on the environment. So ultimately, there's no benefit in reducing animal-based proteins in the diet if you replace it with processed foods, because that overconsumption is damaging both for our bodies and for the environment. That's a big point. And there's an environmental cost, and there's also a cost on the medical system, which in turn can have downstream effects on the environment. If your people are overweight and sick, it's millions and trillions of dollars in disease and hospitals and everything in that whole industry. And I want to go back just to put the, uh, this in maybe different terms for the audience in case they didn't get it. The fact that protein stayed the same is actually the, the best uh, evidence to support your theory. That's the whole yeah. thing you're saying is like over the years, protein stayed the same because yes, people, humans will always be driven to eat the same amount of protein. And so if your foods are diluted of protein, AKA processed foods, then you're screwed and you're gonna be eating more calories from fats or carbs. So it's, it's a very elegant theory that I don't know why more people aren't talking about is that this is the problem. Well, it's even, it's even worse actually for humans than it would be for um, other species that have a higher protein diet than we do. The, the, the human typical percent of calories from protein is around 15 to 20%. That's, that's the sort of standard value that pops up every time we look at a human population around the world. It's seldom outside that range. Now, what that means is that only a 1% dilution of protein in the food supply will drive a 10% increase in calorie intake. And that's straightforward Euclidean geometry. You know, any, any school kid doing math would work that one out. It gives protein enormous leverage, and that's why we called it protein leverage, over our total um, appetite and our total intake. And it also means that anything that shifts the protein requirement um, upwards relative to energy needs will make things far worse. And that's exactly what happens during diabetes, um, obesity. It happens um, under various other circumstances as well. But that gives you a, a new insight into some of the accelerants that are working in our modern environment to drive obesity at an even faster rate. So there's a whole series of interesting aspects that emerge out of that very simple relationship between protein and non-protein energy in the diet. Yeah, and, and fiber plays a role too. So right. fiber, I understand, I mean, there, there's a need for fiber, but I think it's a little different than people think because you know there's insoluble fiber and soluble fiber and i think there's great benefits to the microbiome for this soluble fiber and, and you know that's a big rabbit hole to go down but the the part that people don't consider is that it adds volume to your food for one it means that you're eating whole food right and it's, it's in nature's form i think it's very important to eat foods in their natural form and it helps you to regulate your satiety and and part of that is the volume so that all humans eat about three to four pounds of food per day. And if you're eating, say, a potato chip, it's taking the potato and reducing the, you know, there is a little protein in potato, there's some nutrients in potatoes, but you're taking it and making it extremely calorie dense, right? So that you're getting this tiny little chip with tons of fat and tons of energy for very little satiety. So then of course you're gonna eat too much because you, you Right, so that that fiber, you've taken all the fiber out, or fruit. You you drink juice. If you're just drinking fruit juice all day, that's not going to work out well. You, you want to eat it in this whole form. So fiber, it's like you need this volume and weight of food to feel full. So if you could talk about that as as part of the equation. Well, we're exactly right. You uh, you don't even know that you've you know you've eaten it until you've overeaten it because you don't have that volumetric break and signal. Um, do you want to elaborate on that, Steve? Yeah, and I, I think there's, there's a really crucial point here, Brian, and that is that protein leverage is that if you dilute protein in the diet, you will eat more food. If that food contains um, more cellular or more fiber, and it's the fiber that's diluting protein, then you'll eat more, but you won't eat more energy. It's only when the protein is diluted, not by fiber, but by um, energetic macronutrients, in other words, fats, carbohydrates, you can add alcohol to that, alcohol, yeah. 
that's when you're going to be overeating um, calories. So eating more food per se isn't a problem. It's only when that food is higher in energy density. So, so fiber is really important in that respect. And the, the other, and we now realize how significant this is, the other issue that you've alluded to in your potato chip example, is that not only is a potato chip high in fat, um, low in fiber, um, and very low in percent protein, it's also designed to taste like it is protein. It has all the umami characteristics that our appetite system has come to expect in high protein foods. And our most recent work looking at the hormonal control of protein appetite has shown that there's, there's a hormone that's released particularly from your liver called FGF21. And it's released specifically under low protein and accompanied particularly with high carb intakes, but low protein elicits a robust increase in FGF21. And when it gets into circulation, what it does is it causes you or a mouse or whatever other animal that happens to be floating around in, because it's common to many species, to seek protein and specifically to seek savory flavored cues, tastes and flavors that have through evolution, become associated with high-protein food. So when you need protein, this hormone goes up, you crave savoury flavours, umami flavours, and if the nearest one happens to be a potato chip, then it's a decoy. We've called them protein decoys. And we think savoury flavoured protein decoys in the ultra-processed food world are among the most serious contributors to the obesity epidemic. And we even showed that in our own experiments, um, clinical trials, where we put people on a low-protein diet and provided them with snacks and main meals that were designed to taste either savoury or sweet, but fixed in their macronutrient composition. And we found low-protein-fed people specifically fed on savory snacks between meals and those extra calories were an important part of the protein leverage response so mm. yeah that's another part of the fiber story that that intersects directly with the ultra processing of food it's also a very clever strategy if you want to sell foods because one of the reasons, obviously, that we crave, crave protein is that we're in protein imbalance. We've eaten too much fat and carbs relative to protein. So we target these protein-flavoured foods and they exacerbate the imbalance. So they heighten the craving. And I think everyone knows the feeling of starting out with a bag of um, savoury-flavoured potato crisps and, and they get nicer and nicer as you go on. And, and that's the positive feedback. It's taking us further out of protein balance, causing increased um, craving for protein, causing us to eat more of them. The food industry is genius. It's genius. They're, they know what they're doing. And people probably realize by now that they're trying to make money, not give you nutrition. Uh, they have zero, zero impetus to give you nutrition and all of it to, to make money and a Dorito effect by... Mark Schatzker is a great book. I've interviewed him twice now. And he really tells a story of, of, he's just a great writer and maybe a more approachable, he's a non-scientist, you know, that if you want to read the book to understand how, and he goes into this stuff, right? It's like these, these fake flavors like MSG and all the fake flavors on a Dorito make your body think that it's getting protein when it's not. And yeah, that's, that's a big, big thing. So well, you, you mentioned mice. Can you go into some other animals that you studied and just give more examples? Because reading the book was so great to see all the different examples and experiments done to show this theory. Well, Dave, you go for it. I think okay. our latest tally was more than 40 species, wasn't it? Yeah, but a lot of those in the wild, Brian. So uh, mice are one of the systems like locusts that we've studied extensively as a model system in laboratory 
um, circumstances where, as I said earlier on, we can attain very, very tight control over what differs and what doesn't differ between experimental treatments. At the other end of the spectrum is, and that's very important because we can establish what causes what in that type of research. But the other question that arises is once we know what causes what, we need to know how relevant those causes are in a natural environment or in, in the broader environment in which they interact to potentially interact on a daily basis. And for that, you have to get out of the laboratory and look at the way that animals feed in the wild. So you have both the causes and the relevance of those causes. Um, as nutritional ecologists, we um, have done a lot of work on feeding by animals in the natural environment, as I said earlier on. And one of the um, groups that we focus on, particularly with collaborators across the world, are primates, non-human primates, for a number of reasons, the obvious one being that they're you know, most closely related to ourselves. And for many of the primates that we study, we see that same pattern playing out in a natural situation. We're able to understand why it evolved. Because if you take, for example, orangutans in their natural environment in Borneo, they are confronted with natural fluctuations in the availability of nutrients within their food environments. At some periods, fruits are abundantly available. At other periods, fruits are very scarce and they're stuck on a high protein diet. Now, what they do is their simple rule that they follow is on a daily basis, regardless of what the ecological circumstances are high fruit, hence high fat and carbs, or low fruit, hence high protein. They eat the same amount of protein every day. What that means is that energy intake follows passively um, from changes in what's available in the environment. Some periods they overeat energy, and we now know now that they're storing that energy as fat in the same way as what humans do. But for them, it's not a problem because they evolutionarily they can rely and ecologically rely on periods when energy is scarce in the environment and they then burn those fat stores to supplement the limiting energy. So they have a boom and bust ecology, too much energy store, too little energy draw on those stores. And that's the evolutionary background, we believe, from which protein leverage in our own species evolved. The difference, though, is um, two things. Firstly, um, in our modern environments, there are no periods in which we need to rely on those fat stores, as do the orangutans and other species. We see the same thing in chimpanzees, our closest living relatives. Um, and the second difference is that the foods that are driving energy overconsumption, driving that cycle in an adaptive way, are natural whole foods. So they're rich in vitamins, they're rich in minerals, they're rich in fiber, as well as in energy and low in protein. So in our world, we have no period of shortage and also the foods that are driving it are basically nutrient, fiber, as well as protein poor. And you mentioned it earlier, the categories of carbohydrates and fats are cheap, simple, and palatable. And so we can understand how we've evolved from an orangutan chimpanzee type environment to type evolutionary ecology to encounter the sorts of problems that we're encountering in obesogenic food um, environments in which we now live. And you've also shown if you take orangutans or other primate species and put them on either a, a human junk food diet or in the case of orangs in captivity, nothing but fruit, they end up with the same problems as we do. Obesity. And that's in captivity. That's, a, that's been a big issue. Our, our work um, with, um, with Erin Vogel at Rutgers in the United States, she leads the orangutan um, a program that um, I collaborate um, on, um, has, has now been adopted in um, international zoo nutrition guidelines to prevent the problem of obesity in rehabilitation centers for orangutans and also in zoos. 
But what I'm also doing, you mentioned China earlier, is it's not only in captive situations that you get this problem arising in other species. You also get it arising where um, wild natural populations are coming increasingly into contact with humans, particularly tourists. And the tourists are feeding them processed foods. And in many cases, they're being provided supplementary foods to attract them to tourist sites for commercial and, and other reasons. And you're getting the same thing happening. That's what I was doing in China, studying rhesus macaques and showing that exactly the same thing happens. They are now undergoing what's known as a nutrition transition in the same way as our species did, starting from natural whole food diets, um, transitioning onto these predominantly processed diets with the same result. They're becoming a beast, a diabetic and all the sorts of problems. That we have. And again, that's further evidence. Nothing wrong with our biology. It's doing what it ought to do, but it's doing it in the wrong environment. And that's the consequence that we're suffering. It's, this is one more nail in the coffin, this calorie counting, you know, all calories are the same type of thing. Any animal that eats what humans eat becomes fat and sick, like dogs, right? We, we feed them the wrong diet and they become diabetic and they have shorter lives. And, you know, dogs need raw food, raw meat. This is what they ate for all of history, chewing on bones and organs. And when you give them the kibble, they, they get fat and have shorter lives. And it, and I, it was interesting, Steve said that even if you control an animal's environment, then that could screw things up as well. So if you give the, I think it was orangutans, just fruit, which is not natural because in a natural environment, they could go outside and get things more than fruit. But if they just have fruit, their, their ratio is wrong and they become sick. Yeah. So of course, that's an interesting point because the fruit, of course, is a natural food. Um, that's what they've evolved to eat. But, but maintaining them exclusively on fruits is a natural interact relationship of their biology with the food environment. And there is another really interesting angle here, and that is um, the fruit is not entirely natural because in domestication, there have been massive changes in the composition of fruits relative to what happened um, relative to the composition of, of wild fruits, um, natural fruits. And again, those are um, driven by uh, the commercial need to increase, firstly, palatability. So it's, it's kind of economic competition. And secondly, here, to develop fruits that grow to a large size in a short period of time uh, for commercial rather than for health reasons. Um, so you get very similar um, trajectory, even in natural foods, um, as a result of, of human culture, basically science, breeding programs, cultivation methods. That's what we do uh, in, in the case of the, the extreme in that, of course, now is industrially produced foods in, in factories. And even worse, um, with rising global carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, uh, it's now well known that that's diluting protein in our staple crops as a result of uh, the biochemistry of photosynthesis. If you've got more CO2, you end up with more um, sugars and, and simple carbohydrates, less fiber and proportionately less protein in plants. That's just a natural consequence of changing um, CO2 fertilization, as it were, of photosynthesis in plants, including our crop plants. So even um, global climate change and CO2 levels rising in the atmosphere are feeding in to influence and interact with our basic biology, in this case, our protein appetite system. So it just shows why it's really important to have a, a system view a systems mm -hmm. approach to understanding um, the interaction between our biology and our nutritional and broader environment. And it really allows you to start thinking about all of those things um, and intervening in that system in a really structured way. Yeah, how it yeah. all connects up, really important. And, and that's critical for thinking about what's causing the problem and, and therefore what are the best approaches to solving it. And it's very easy um, and to some extent justified to say, well, the food industry is causing the problem. 
But if you think about it on a different scale, these aren't evil people. These are people doing jobs and doing their jobs immensely well. I um, hesitate to add perhaps better than us public health people are doing our jobs because they're willing, they're winning the battle uh, in the short term at least. Um, it's a systems perspective. The policy environment is critically important in driving that problem. Consumer responses, local and individual initiatives, the only way to solve the problem is to step back and look at the system's dynamics. It's an ecosystem like any other ecosystem. It is just a highly modified and different one from the ones that we usually think about in terms of ecology. So I love this so much. And I think that's why you're some, maybe my favorite people in this space after 10 years, you too have the most accurate high level view because you're taking the systems approach. And as, as you get in this space, it's, it's nice. Sometimes people go down into the trend or this is a fad or this is, you know, my thing. I'm the carnivore doctor or I'm, you know, the keto guy. And then you don't see things from this high level. And so over the years, I've zoomed out and zoomed out and zoomed out until I see it, how you're seeing it. It's, it's a, from a world's perspective. And the highest level I look at it is that nature has it figured out and they have its golden ratio. You right? People know what the golden ratio. It's like the, everything has a golden ratio in nature. And until we started messing with things, like you said, more CO2 means protein dilution and nutrient dilution and cultivating apples to be gigantic and sweet that that has changed the golden ratio of nature, right? And so now that there's more energy and less nutrients in that apple, and then we see these effects way down the line. And now we're just seeing them and it's really ramped up since say 1980, there, there was a really uh, the biggest uptick if you look at the big macro data. And I think that's when we started eating the most processed foods. In 1980, there was this big, you know, low fat, like processed foods uh, are okay. Just count your calories type of thing. and and it's been disastrous ever since. But it's really just, you can't mess with nature. It's, well, it's worth it. it, it yeah, no, you go, go ahead, Steve, I'll get back no, to No, no, I was just, I was just gonna come back to domestic dogs um, you mentioned earlier. Um, and they're a really neat illustration that natural selection will solve these problems um, at great individual cost over generations. Um, Dogs have evolved such that their optimal diet now, we did a whole series of studies um, about 10, 15 years ago now, looking at different species of dogs, compared to their um, ancestral species, you know, wild wolves, their diet and their optimal diet is, is way different and it far better and their physiology reflects that far better now reflects the scraps that humans have been throwing them for, what is it, 10, 15,000 years. So we do, and species do evolve to changing nutritional environments. And that's why you end up with this diversity of optimal diets across species. Uh, it's just that we're changing our and have changed our food environment so rapidly that we're not able to keep up with this without massive health costs, at least in the short term. Natural mm -hmm. selection will sort it out. It'll just cause billions of deaths over generations. And, and then, of course, the medical industry would can't oppose it, and rightly so, because natural selection um, really operates on biological dysfunction, inability to reproduce, premature deaths, cancers, and all of the things that we are seeing increasingly. But medical science and the pharmaceutical industry um, are kind of uh, filling the gap to some extent. So even natural selection, I think, would have a, um, a hard time correcting, the, yeah. writing the ship steering the ship in the direction I believe it needs to go. This evolutionary perspective that Steve raised is a really very important perspective because one way of 
of getting the big picture, as you mentioned, is to step back and take a systems perspective. But the other is to look deep into time. Of course, these things interact. Natural selection happens in ecological systems. And deep in time, when we look at species in their natural environments, and ours is no exception, hunter-gatherers, for example, that I've worked with, um, what has happened is that over millions of years, our bodies have come to adapt and our behavior, feeding behavior, has come to adapt to a certain environment. And, and what's driven that adaptation is beneficial health outcomes, largely. Um, what's happening now is we're adapting our environment to suit aspects of our biology, but they're the wrong aspects of our biology. Rather than health outcomes, we're adapting our environment to suit commercial and also short-term pleasure outcomes. And this is where you get that evolutionary mismatch taking place within human society, is the way that rather than bodies adapting as they have in every other species, those bodies are now capable of adapting the environment in ways that no longer suit those um, the, uh, biological requirements of those bodies. Well, the way I see it, I I just put out episode one of the film, well, not publicly, but of Food Lies, where we looked at evolution. And it seems to me for, for the first couple millions of years since we, we got fire and we started hunting and all this stuff, our bodies did go through crazy changes and our digestive systems changed, our brains got bigger, all this type of stuff. So they were kind of beneficial changes. And then at a certain point, they turned into detrimental changes with, with processed foods. And I mean, even since agriculture, we got a bit shorter, our brains got smaller, more disease. And people, you know, can attribute that to many different things. But I, I think that lowered our nutrient in, to energy ratio, right? When we started filling up our, our body, our diets with grains that went away from whole foods. And I think that's the main driver of those changes. So if you're, I, I don't know, what, what, what do you, do you think that we could adapt long enough time periods to be okay with processed foods? I mean, maybe we could live this, with modern medicine, but I don't think we would have the same vibrance and health span and robustness. It's taken us millions of years to get where we are now. The problem has arisen in decades since probably the 50s, 1960s. Um, that perspective is, it's off scale, I believe. It's not just resistance to obesity. It is, we would require, um, uh, we would require different physiological relationships with fiber, with micronutrients. Evolution is an integrated package. It's not just one thing or the other. And that's why it's taken so long um, in the natural world to evolve things in the way that they've evolved. And as Steve mentioned earlier, there are a lot of tears along the way because evolution <clears throat> thrives. The engine of evolution is failure as much as it is success. And there will be a lot of those over a very long time scale if we rely on evolution to solve the problem that we've created with our environment. Plus, the comes, environment will co-evolve. The yeah. commercial interests will continue to adapt to our change biology. And it, it comes right back to the complexity of the challenge that is facing all organisms to balance their intake of dozens of different nutrients. And one of the, the great tricks that's been used by natural selection is to take advantage of correlations that occur between many of these things so that you don't need to have appetites for a hundred different nutrients. You only need a small number of appetites and everything else comes through correlation and you'll end up with a balanced diet by not counting only one thing, calories, but counting a small number of things and judging your total nutrition in relation to how well you meet those um, regulated variables. Now, what's happened in the um, processed food environment is we've smashed those correlations. We've stripped out fiber. We've broken up the micronutrients so that we have to take them separately as supplements. Well, we don't have to, but you, if you eat a particular diet, you'll be deficient and you'll need to augment your diet. That's generated another industry, of course, the supplements industry. So the whole problem now becomes uh, we're unable or, or our, our physiology is unable to, to take account of or at least to rely on those correlations that were there and crucial um, to our 
uh, nutritional balancing system in the first place. That yeah, is such an important point because what it shows is that we've spoken about the complexity of the system we're dealing with, but actually solutions can be very simple. And that's an example of evolution simplifying the problem to the level that really matters. And we can do the same. We don't need to count calories or do complex calculations. At the individual level, we can simplify the problem to reducing quite dramatically the proportion of machine-made foods in our diets, exposing our bodies to the types of food environment that they're adapted to do their job in, as does do the bodies of every other species that we've studied in appropriate food environments. That's a very simple problem. It's a one-dimensional problem, whole foods versus processed foods. That's the whole food life series right there. We have to explain it in 10 different ways or 100 different ways. But yes, I, for all of history, we could eat foods and it, we would get the right amount of protein and nutrients. And so we didn't have to have appetites for each one. I guess I'm just trying to uh, make maybe it a little easier to understand is maybe if we could, if that those correlations didn't exist, where if we got protein, we got savory flavors, that meant we got nutrients along with it. Yep. then we didn't have to have specific appetites for magnesium and for exactly. You know, everything. Yeah. exactly. That's exactly the point. And, you know, whether there's five dimensions or whether there's as Ted suggesting you can, or well, as we've shown as well, you can get a great step change in understanding human feeding behavior if you uh, move from counting calories to considering protein and non-protein energy as, as two um key dimensions, you can then add in a small number of others and you'll start to get a really good understanding um, of, of nutrition. You don't need to consider simultaneously 100 different things because they're all um, coming together correlated with those things that are being regulated. So that, I think, is a really important point. Absolutely. And I want to go back. We're running out of time, but you're talking about pretty much seasonal eating and that's very different and or with our environment we, we we never have a lack of calories so i think people throughout history talking about hunter gatherers yeah maybe it was good to kind of fatten up for winter and then there's times of more scarcity but like you said there's never that there's never that scarcity more there's always a 7-eleven or whatever grocery store around the corner and so people never do that anymore well it's even at a shorter scale um, if you look at the, the scale of 24 hours, we, we have evolved to not eat when we're asleep and to sleep when it's dark, um, to have periods of, therefore, fasting throughout 24 hours. Um, and our circadian biology, let alone our seasonal um, clock systems, are all tuned to nutrition and the provision and flow of nutrients from the environment. And we've We've messed that up as well. If you go right down to the molecular biology of circadian um, clocks at the level of individual cells throughout your body, uh, things like insulin receptors are coupled to them. So metabolism and time, and hence food and time, are intimately related and interconnected in our biology. We've broken that. The other thing, Brian, is you mentioned earlier on um, in the natural environments, we like orangutans would go through these feast and famine situations. It's actually very hard to put on fat in a natural environment. In 2019, I spent, um, I spent a month with a group of hunter gatherers in the Congo Basin. These are all very lean, very healthy, very fit people. Um, and you can see why there's no obesity, because the effort required to pick the number of fruits or gather the amount of honey, for example, um, in order to overeat calories is immense. So, so that would have been a challenge. So to some extent, we relied evolutionary on a physiology that has a very low threshold for accumulating fat, because ecologically it's difficult to overeat energy in those circumstances. Um, and of course, that's also playing an important role in the obesity epidemic. A uh, short fuse for putting on and a very long fuse for losing what we've put on. 
it's a terrible environment we have now. So you have to very purposefully change your food environment and physical environment, you know, movement and other stuff to, to get those changes. So we ran out of time here, but I just want to say most, most people do want to lose fat. And so we've kind of alluded to it the whole time and talked about, I mean, basically you need to raise your protein ratio or percentage in your diet, right? And then that caused the, the animals that you've studied and humans to, to be able to lose fat because you can dial up that protein percentage and it will help you lose fat. And, and then you don't have to be, you know, stuck in some fad thing. It's not as sexy, right? It's like everyone on the internet can get more followers if they tell you some secret, oh, this is the secret, or you have to eat this. You know, it's actually a non-sexy, just broad theory that you just need to up your percentage of protein. <laughs> But, but the protein derived from foods, not from ultra processed products, it will not help the broader spectrum in terms of health of doing that through eating a protein supplement alone, because of the reason we discussed previously, there are a lot of things that come together with protein that we need in our diet. And those are packaged in the form of foods rather than purified ingredients. Very good point to add on. Any, any last words, Steve? No, no, that's uh, been a very interesting and broad ranging discussion. Thank you very much, Brian. <laughs> uh, thanks to both of you. And I really recommend your book. Definitely. Down, it's, it's released under two names, Five Appetites and Eat Like the Animals. Buy it wherever you can. I'm telling you, it's great. And uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Brian. I really enjoyed that.